Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest is a German entrepreneur with a PhD in international law. He is the inventor of the Free Cities concept and the founder of Free Cities Foundation. He is also the CEO of Tipolis, where he is focused on creating and developing autonomous cities by partnering commercially with governments and special economic zones around the world. Please welcome to the show, Titus Gable. Titus, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Mikkel. It's great being here. I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation. Why don't you take a minute and kind of walk us through a little bit of your backstory? How did you get working into this? Um, there's so much to go through in today's conversation. Sure. I mean, basically out of frustration with the political systems and environment, I was involved for about, I would say, more than 30 years in somehow German politics. I uh, was a member of a classic liberal party, I was personally known to some ministers in the federal government. And I found out that my ideas, which probably I share with you and most of your listeners um, about freedom and liberty and self-responsibility, um, but also being uh, accountable for what you do, um, these ideas are unfortunately not shared by the majority. And uh, in in democracies, especially, uh, but not limited to, uh, the parties who promise you to take away the risk of your life or give you free lunch, they eventually will will be elected. And if you say, "Hey, what about you got freedom, but you have to take care of yourself?" That is not so popular, and that's also understandable because most people just um, want to get maximum result for minimum effort, uh, what I call a minimum principle, right? And if politicians promise that, hey, vote for me, you get something for free, then eventually this is going to happen, right? And that that also led to the idea that over time, so-called classical liberal parties became redistribution parties. And well, that's in a nutshell what motivated me. Okay, let's go back even a little bit further in time, because you said you had 30 years mm -hmm. experience in German politics, but you're not a politician. You didn't do that. What did you do before kind of going into these concepts? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I was in, having an education as a lawyer. I started uh, working in a law firm uh, for about five years and then decided this is not what I want to do until the rest of my life. But I was involved in politics from early on. I was in, in even in school, university, I was a member of, uh, of those uh, groups. I became a party member and was basically on a, on a, a local level kind of politician. And um, but but my main purpose then was, uh, oh, no, not being a lawyer, but becoming an entrepreneur or at least being part of an industry where something is created. And then I my first station was at biotech industry in, in the region where I live, which is uh, Heidelberg, Mannheim area of Germany, in the southern part of Germany. And um, that was interesting. And from there, I got to the venture capital industry. Basically, I switched the, the, the sides of the table, right? Because biotech was completely financed by venture capitalists. And and then I thought, this is a good idea. It's an interesting thing. And um, eventually, um, uh, was involved there. And um, by reading newspapers, I said, uh, I discovered that uh, back in 2003, 2004, we should uh, go into the resources industry because nobody wants to start any new mines, not even studying geology or mining engineering. And on the other hand, uh, on the demand side, the Chinese were growing by the day um, and um, uh, had had an increase uh, an increase in demand for metals and all that stuff. Um, just to, to give you a number, when I started at that time, two thousand three, two thousand four, the Chinese were accounting for ten percent of the metals that were produced in the world, the raw materials. And today it's twenty five percent, right? So it's it, in a very short period of time that that uh, really went up tremendously. And I said, okay, this is, if nobody wants to start new mines and the Chinese have a higher demand, uh, extremely higher demand, then the solution can only be the price. And uh, then let's go into that, <laughs> let's go into that uh, uh, branch and into this industry. And then I started a company eventually on my own 
um, uh, to, in 2006 uh, in this sector, mining and later oil and gas was added, uh, Deutsche Rohstoff AG. Okay, because I'm trying to understand like the genesis of these ideas and like the background behind all of it. Because, I mean, we've talked on this program numerous times about special special economic zones and charter cities and free private cities and everything like that. But a lot of these ideas they they do originate with you, and 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 we can see mm -hmm. the different pieces. But I want to understand your background. That's why I keep asking about these types of things. So you had a background in politics and a background in. Um, legal aspect, going to school and practicing as a as a as a lawyer, but then on so the entrepreneurial venture. So it's yeah. almost like a recipe, you know, the different pieces of the puzzle, <laughs> the different yeah. ingredients yeah. that kind of yeah. go into these types of things. Because, and we, and we, I promise we will get into it in a minute. But I mean, what you're proposing in your books and in your work is is massive. Like it is an absolute massive, massive undertaking. So I. I, it's almost like a, you know, this sounds rude, but it's not meant to be rude, but it's almost like a, you know, why are you the man to be able to do these types of things? Do you, you know, do you have that type of a background to be able to put something together? Yeah, I think it's not even necessary that I'm the guy who's putting that together because the idea of writing the book was that others can, can also try it out. But I mean, there's some truth to what you said, right? I have the ingredients for something like this to happen. Indeed, is 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 with me because of the legal background, um, experience with politics, first-hand experience with politics, uh, plus the entrepreneurial thing. And the company I set up went public in 2010 was extremely successful. I could retire at the end of 2014. So maybe this all together brings me in a situation where I say, yeah, it can be done. And interestingly, when I did my PhD in law at Heidelberg University, it was about international public law. And I said, probably I will never need this in my life. But now I do, right? I mean, it's good that uh, when, when making this arrangement with governments, that's exactly what I need. And in so far, it's it's a, a fortunate combination of different things that, that are helping me now making this a reality. Well, because if I think about my own background, okay, I have an entrepreneurial background, I have a background in finance, but if I had to deal with, okay, I deal with governments on an immigration issue, but I basically am just following the forms and 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 doing what, you know, following the rules that they set. But if I actually had to go in and negotiate with governments, that would be horrible because I'm just too outspoken and I'm just too rude. And like, I wouldn't make a good impression whatsoever, but you probably have a very good understanding of how to communicate with them, how to express your ideas and make sure that they understand to do presentations on a way that they have expectations with. I mean, for me, that's very, very interesting. Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, I mean, everybody can 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 learn to speak uh, speak well politely, right? But I think it's more than that. It's you have to understand what their concerns are, and you have to understand what they are looking for. And and th this is a variety of things, right? It's it's not only they're looking for jobs and investments. Of course, every government is this, especially in emerging and developing countries. But it's also they are afraid of doing something which is too radically new because then they got under fire. And so if you can point to other places in the world where something which is at least comparable is happening, this is a big relief, right? This is a big relief. If, uh, and, and things like that. These are the small things that uh, experience you get over the years and understand better dealing with them, understanding their position and what they, they consider um, a favorable outcome. And sometimes uh, it's not possible, but but uh, if they are interested and have really understood the model, then I think there's a there's a chance that that we can come uh, to terms. So, what are some of the examples you like to give then of success stories around the world for this type of progression mm -hmm. of ideas or model of ideas? Yeah. Well, well, one one of the trends that are undeniable there is the increase in number of special economic zones but there's a subtrend special economic zones are also getting more and more autonomous over time they started with just export import free ports then you got manufacturing export processing zones then suddenly you had heavy industries um big 
industrial zones like Jebel Ali zone in, in Dubai. Uh, and then you started going into the service sector. Then suddenly you had tourism special zones. And then you had financial zones. And then you had um, zones like the Dubai International Financial Center, which, which has own courts, an own legal system. They have even an own family law to attract the experts, which makes it really part, kind of an autonomous city already, right? And then you have the other trend that I would say it's a big privatization trend, especially special economic zones that are privately administered are normally more successful than the state owned and administered zones. And now the new thing is that we say, well, actually, we want that you government delegate your government capacities to a private company within a framework that we agree upon. And maybe there is a joint commission, but actually it's government by service, right? Or government as a service. And that is sellable because it's not totally new. And um, the the more difficult thing is, hey, um, we want to, to have the um, uh, capacity to make own rules. That is difficult. Own courts is also difficult. So um, I remember when I was talking to a government and they said, but is such a law where you can make own rules in such a zone? Is this already existing? And I said, yeah, in several places in Honduras, for example, also in Azerbaijan. And then I could see the big relief in their faces that they are not the first. Sure, right? sure, sure. Because this is very important to politicians, obviously. And um, and in so far, we can point to places like um, Hong Kong, Singapore, Monaco, which are more traditional city states. Hong Kong, not Hong Kong, is really a one country, two systems model. Um, which we are basically also want to copy, but the difference would be that it is governed then by a private company. Um, and um, so it's not, I would say, 100% new. It's maybe 40% new, which makes it a bit easier then. Okay. Well, so I like the sound of government as a service. And I'm an entrepreneur, so a lot of my money gets spent on software as a service, SaaS products. So we could probably call these like gas products or something like that. I think that has a nice sound to it. Government as a service. Mm. Now, the trend that we have been seeing, Titus, over the last, I don't know, three years, three plus years, is an absolute encroachment by government in every facet of our lives. But it's very interesting to, to think or to see that with special economic zones and Zetis and charter cities and these types of things, that actually these are coming up in the background that a lot of people actually don't realize. And there is little mm -hmm. enclaves of freedom that are happening. Now, they're not out there in mainstream media and probably a lot lot of people don't know about them, but we are making progress in, in certain respects. Absolutely. And I think one of the reasons why they're not so much in the focus of the public is that they're basically not happening in the Western world. So you have 150 countries that have now more than 5,000 special economic zones, um, but um, not none of them in the European Union. I think there are some still remaining zones in Poland that have to uh, close down by 2026 or 27. Um, but uh, no in the US, no, which have substantial autonomy, uh, zero. Um, but in the developing world and in the um, global south, this is absolutely standard, right? So, and indeed, uh, un more or less unnoticed um, uh, from the from the global public, um, especially in Central Asia, the Middle East, um, innovative governments and also courageous governments, they have tried our new thing. Right? Dubai International Financial Center was a totally new thing. It's just only 15 years old. And a lot of, of people said, oh, that can't work. And then it worked. And now it's copied in Abu Dhabi. It's copied in, in Kazakhstan. And there are other countries which are trying to do the same. And now people say, ah, oh, we should, or some governments say, we should have been on board then when the train was leaving the station. And we say, oh, now it's too late. I mean, but you can be then on the next train, you can be the first, right? So that's a bit, a little bit um, the, the thing. And you are also right, Mikael, that, that there's an ever increasing 
grip of governments. They want to regulate everything, uh, even how how you eat and speak and think. And um, on the other hand, you have a we have a tendency to uh, ever uh, more privatization because governments are not capable of doing things any longer. And interestingly, even in areas where we would say no, this is the core area of government. Policy making, space travel, war. Even mm -hmm. they are privatizing those. Um, it, it, it's ridiculous. In the European Union, um, despite the many public officers in the in the Commission and the ministries, they are hiring Price Waterhouse Coopers and McKinsey to to make uh, the decisions for them. Right? They are um, uh, even the U.S. is not capable of sending enough freight into space, so they have to rely on a private company, which is SpaceX, right? Which is covering I don't know ninety percent of all uh, space freight travel today. And even countries like Russia rely on private mercenary groups to to fight their wars. I mean, yeah, this is Wagner incredible. Group. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. And there's uh, equivalents of Wagner Group in the West as well, right? You know, the uh, Blackwater. BlackRock, but now it's called, yeah, I can't Black, remember Black what Black Water. The, it's, yeah. called, it's called or Alumni Water, or something. Yeah. 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 So, and and that shows you there is a trend already that goes into our direction, albeit it's not much discussed, right? Yeah, but it's just... It's so interesting the the shift between the West and or say the developing world and uh, sorry the developed world and now the developing world because really you know my main business is I work as a consultant I I help relocate wealthy families overseas and we're dealing with their tax issues and immigration issues and their financial issues and there's this massive capital flight happening from the Western world especially mm -hmm. Canada and the United States like we're just taking absolute million like. Every day, every week, we're moving millionaires out of those countries and they're looking for a place to park their money and to have a little bit more freedom and have a little bit more predictability about what's going to happen. Because how are you to build a business? How are you to create a life or or set your family up if you have no idea what's going to happen in the future? You can't you can't build anything on such a rocky foundation. And that's what we're seeing with the West. Where do you think that charter cities or free private cities or international cities, which we, you know, maybe we can define uh, the new mm -hmm. term that we'll be using. Um, where do you see or how do you see that fitting in and solving some of those problems? Well, it, it's it, it does solve those issues, right, because developing countries um, um, are. Uh, developing countries for a reason, and mostly it's because there's no rule of law. There is no, there's a lot of corruption. There's no efficiency. So if you now are in the um, in Canada and uh, maybe your bank account has been frozen by Mr. Trudeau because you were participating in some protests, right? You say goodbye. Um, then you don't want to go from one bad place to another right and and so far i think we can we can i mean it's still early days but this is the idea of of international cities that we create a safe haven for those people who want a rule of law based first world environment uh, but want to escape from the ever uh, authoritarian uh, western so called free states and um and this is I mean, if you go to a developing country, there are other issues. That is, uh, especially when it comes to rule of law and 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 safety uh, of your um, your companies, and um, and that is that is an issue we want to solve. So we we actually want to um, take the best of all worlds, uh, and especially the best of the free market, because we say if you think that government is a service or should be a service. And I definitely think that it is not everything. It's not something else. It's exactly a service. You want protection of life, liberty, and property. We provide this against the fee, right? So there's so many advantages. Um, first, it's a fixed fee. We can change that later on. And so we are not... Uh, investigating your your uh your assets or stuff like that and then you forget to declare something you went in prison you go in prison for that we say hey it's a fee you pay your fee all good right the second thing is we are we can be held liable right because we are service providers so we say okay you tell me Mikkel um hey Titus I have paid for for protection of my 
a life, liberty, and property, and now it was broken into my apartment. Uh, you you owe me damages, and you're right. I owe you damages, right? Because I'm a service provider didn't pro- <laughs> didn't deliver, and and these are things that a lot of people know when they're they're making business like that every day. But now you just transfer this idea to what I call the market of living together. And then suddenly everything is clear. That's not so utopian and radical any longer. It's just a service, right? And the idea is that we limit this service to protection of life, liberty, and property because everything else, people are different. But being secure and safe, everybody wants that, even a criminal. Right? So sure. that is what you have to must buy. And for the rest, there are all kinds of association and services and private insurance as possible. That depends on your personal taste. So that is, in a nutshell, what we think we can bring to the table. The big, the big issue is to to find a government to agree on that um, autonomy, so that we can make it happen. Well, and I remember, I don't know if we were sitting together in Georgia in Tbilisi, or maybe it was when you came down here to visit me in Panama. But I remember you telling me a story where you were sitting down with someone, and you were looking. He said. And I'm going to paraphrase, but basically, I love the idea, except the name. Governments don't like the word free and they don't like the word private. Maybe you can elaborate on that and kind of like where where that led to in the new naming and branding of things. Yeah, um, uh, indeed. I mean, that was uh, a diplomat that told me that this is a good concept. He has he um, read my book, Free Private Cities, Making Governments Compete for You. And he said, it's a good idea, but uh, free private cities, three words and government dislike too, which is the word free and the word private. And so, okay, I have to accept that. (laughs) That's market feedback. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, it's easier. We found that out uh, uh, to, to give it a more general name that is is has a positive connotation and that's international cities and it should be international because we want to attract people from all all over the world not only locals and not only experts from the west right so it should be really open to everyone it should be by design international even our team is international right we have people from all continents so the claim this is neo-colonial well which which colonial power is it right we are a private company with people from all over the world and I live in Monaco, a small principality, which is probably not supposed to become colonial power. So uh, this is all um, this is all um, a situation where we we have discussed this with a lot of people, and the outcome was international city is a good name. It also is is clear enough in what direction this is going. And now the big idea is that we do not want to focus this on one location. We want to create a network of international cities from day one. And we are currently in the negotiations and discussions with about 10 governments. And then the um, the long-term goal is that we create a network of those cities. Um, and with, between the uh, in between the international cities, if you are approved in one city, it's much easier to get around, right? And you have a similar system. You have probably a common law-based system. You know the rules. They might be slightly different from city to city, but it basically they're the same. And then it's maybe even uh, possible to travel visa-free from city to city, regardless in which country those are. And that is the future. And it has been also the past, right? We had this situation uh, in the Middle Ages, with the free imperial cities, and which formed also League, the Hanseatic League or the Southern German uh, city um, um, uh, bund. So there, there, this is all. This already has happened, and it, it's natural if you have have such a thing, and then also smaller states could join the league or whatever. But I think this is the future, and I also think the future is the fee based government model because this taxes. In our world of today, with all the digital nomads, and then, uh, yeah, you work in Panama for a company in 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 Europe, in say in Germany or in France, and they say, yeah, we have to pay some taxes. And you say, why why should I pay taxes? I'm here in Panama, right? And and then they, it's not clear if if the VAT is is due or not, and all this bullshit. And this is totally solved because you want our service, you pay a fee, right? End of the story. So I think eventually that has a chance of success because people eventually go where they're treated best. Absolutely, I believe that 
even if we had one of these international cities, that would be a massive step forward. But when we actually speak about the network effect, basically like, mm -hmm. okay, if I have a computer and the internet, but there's no one else in the world who has a computer and the internet, it's useless. I mean, it doesn't do anything. Same as we saw with the telephone, same as we saw with many other things. But a network effect is becomes more valuable, more people are involved. So, okay, we can have one city, we can grow that city. But if we had two cities, five cities, 50 cities around the world, actually the entire network becomes stronger and more valuable and as you said the ability to tra mm -hmm. to to travel and transfer between cities without all of this excess bureauc bureaucracy through it i mean that's amazing and it's just like we don't have to have them all here in latin america where i am or all in one other place actually they can be spread out all over the world they can be theme based and they can have slight differences to them but the core values are always there and when you're signing into the contract and you're moving into an arrangement like this you know exactly where you're what you're getting it's not like right exactly. now where it's like you're born into a country you if you're if you're born in the united states you owe taxes forever no matter what even if you leave the day after you were born and you move to another country and you, you spend your entire life somewhere else, the IRS is still going to want a bite of your apple. Like, And that has something, an element of serfdom, hasn't it? 100%. Right? It's just, it's mind boggling, yeah. but it exists. Yeah. It happens right now. I deal with it with clients on a daily basis. A lot of people are super surprised. I have a new client who has a US yeah. citizenship and she just, I, I had to break the news to her that she's been liable for taxes for many years. Now we got to get a lot lawyer involved and we have to go back and we have to fix all of this. Mm. And oh, it's. Rough. Yeah. And many, many people are just used to that. Right. But if you, um, if you take the situation, we have seen this in here in Europe that people want to give up the French citizenship, which are taxpayers and that the French do not like that. Right. So they make it really hard to give up your French citizenship. <laughs> And uh, then you have only a year. And if you don't do it within this year, when you have a second one, then it's over. You can't do it and all these things. And um, uh, one of our friends here in Monaco, uh, she married a Monegasque and then also became Monegasque after 10 years. And that was difficult for her to give up the French citizenship, right? And they even asked her uh, at the last date, they had, she had to appear in front of a commission to... Uh, um, uh, with a scissor to cut her passport finally and give it back. And she said, I'm not doing, doing this. Yes, my passport, goodbye. Right. But you yeah. can you can see that is that is not how a customer should be treated in, in our normal free market world, or or even if it's a, re a restricted market. If you are a customer who is leaving, then normally you get a letter saying, we are sorry to see you leave. Tell us what we could do better, right? So this is what you, what you get if you have a government as a service compared to government as we are the rulers and you are subject models. And I think the reason why most people accept that is just because they are used to it. Mm -hmm. But I make the point uh, sometimes to people for people to better understand which crazy system they're living in is when I, I make my car dealer example. I think I've told you that before, um, which is I tell people, let, let's uh, imagine you go to a car dealer because you want to buy a car. And the car dealer tells you, yeah, you can get a car, but here is the problem. Here's the issue. <laughs> I decide the model, I decide the color, the motor, the interior, and the price. And here's another thing, you must buy. And you would say, you are crazy. I go to the next dealer, right? But that is exactly our situation towards the government, right? It's they decide what serv which services they provide or not, and then they decide about the taxes. And, and you mentioned that the so-called social contract is constantly changed every year there are new rules and normally to our disadvantage right and we are not never the party that is changing the contract it's always the other side that is not a contract right exactly and that is one of our big points where we say if you have signed the citizens contract or residence contract in the international city uh we can't change that right it's not possible and because you need two parties to change a contract um, unless we have said, okay, there are some areas like traffic rules where you can make changes, but we cannot just change the fee we are asking you, right? And and that is that is suddenly giving you a totally different position 
um, you're a customer uh, uh, and not a subject. And, and that is a total different story. That changes not everything, but a lot. Well, I would say that, you know, as responsible adults, we should be able to renegotiate contracts. So if you and I have an agreement together, mm-hmm. Titus, yep. and whether it be a handshake or a written agreement, and you've said you'll do one thing and I'll, I'll, uh, I'm will i going to do something else. And you know what? After a month or a year or something like that, I say, actually, Titus, this is not working for me. Can we renegotiate it? Well, then we sit down and we go through it and we find something that's going to work for both parties. But governments are not doing anything like that. They're not renegotiating every day. They're changing the they're changing things on you. And so how do you plan accordingly when you don't know if they're going to change the 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 wind bro- blows in a different direction? You have no idea what's going to happen and you have no say in it. And if you don't do what they say you must do now it can be orange jumpsuit it can be massive fines they can confiscate yep. your passport they can really take away anything and everything and absolutely destroy your life on a whim on a on a political change on a uh, you know something woke that now this is being canceled and who knows you know what you're supposed to do it's just mind boggling to me this is frightening and definitely not satisfying and that was why i said i'm not going to accept this any longer amazing I, and but knowing or at least that was my thesis that i would will not change this by elections because i will never find a majority for that i said okay let's let's try out something completely new let's just look in the in the market what is happening there if you you're dissatisfied with the product and there's no other product inside. You say, okay, then I make my own product, right? And it should Entrepreneurialism, be because, absolutely. Exactly, because there's a demand for that. So, and then that's exactly what I said. And what I did, and I said, okay, let's, it's only for volunteers, right? 100% voluntary uh, consent. If you do not like what is in the contract, don't sign it, don't come. But if you like it, you sign it, then it's clearly that you have agreed to the rules. Other than you and I now, we have never agreed to any rules that are imposed on us every year by the state we belong to. And and that is the point where I think this is going to change in the future, because you cannot live in a world where you are, at least not forever, where you are entitled to decide what you eat, what you drink, where you spend your holiday, how in which color you are painting your house and which car you buy. And on the other hand, there's a things that you have zero say in it, right? What um, amount of taxes you should pay, and they do whatever they want with it. And you might not agree that this money is used for buying tanks for Ukraine or sending troops to Afghanistan. You said I would never pay for that, right? Yeah, bad luck, right? <laughs> and and or subsidize uh, technologies that are not not uh, 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 economic, like like solar and wind in in many countries, right? And people are forced to to subsidize things that they would not with their private money. And that is a discrepancy. And this discrepancy between we have the world of the business of the markets where we that works and it's feeding 8 billion people and then you have the the old world where elected kings <laughs> all right or non-elected kings um or elected and non-elected kings they say what you have to do and i would say this is an ancient regime of the past it's of course not easy to replace it and i'm not going to do this with secession or revolution i'm saying i'm going to discuss this with governments, I'm going to talk to governments, say, let's try a new thing, uh, government as a service, there's something in it for you, jobs, investments, and maybe even some direct payments, percentage of our income or profit or whatever. And then uh, you attract people to your country that otherwise would not come. So that's a win-win situation, right? And so far, I think this has a chance of becoming a reality and not just being a pipe dream of me. Absolutely. Now. Activism, I think, has failed. I believe that activism has failed. I've seen, um, I have seen, I have had friends, I have worked with people who have devoted their lives to activism for pushing back against the state. And mm-hmm. I think that 90% of the people, they now realize after a lifetime of, do, of fighting this, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the only option we have is to create something new. And this is where a lot of the ideas of parallel systems come up and and your work and and even my work as helping people relocate to a new place. Um, 
you just activism is not the answer here. Now, with my work in in relocation of people, we don't have an exact um, written social contract, but what we do have is an understanding of the country that we're moving to, and we're making a voluntary choice to to abide by those laws. So really what you're saying is we will have that, but we will also have it in writing. So now it's just like it really makes a lot a lot of sense. It's the next logical piece of the puzzle, I would say. Exactly. Look, here in Monaco, I mean, a lot of people would la- love to live here, right? It's zero income tax, zero direct taxes. Uh, it's secure. It's 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 a nice weather. It's glamour, everything. But I have, as a non-Monegasque, right? I'm still a German citizen. It's ha- very hard to get Monegasque t- citizenship. I basically have zero rights here, right? They can kick me out every day. So if he, I had a contract, I would much prefer that, right? Give me some 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 written written rights. And, and enforceable rights. And um, this is another thing we, we offer in the international city concept. We say there will be courts for your internal issues, but if you have an issue with us as an operator, you go to external courts that are not part of our organization, right? Yeah, so no than cronyism state, and corruption. No nation state, state, you go to nation state, say, I, I, I think these taxes are illegal and, and the and the courts that are paid by these very taxes should make a decision who is right <laughs> and who is wrong, right? So this is always a little a, a bit shady and yeah, always suspect for sure. And in so far, I think you're right. What you are doing is a kind of already predecessor solution to what we want to make. You you're basically making an arbitrage of which. Thank God we have more than 190 states. Imagine we had world government, right? No more Mikkel Torop. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so and, and people people could really choose between, and you can say, okay, this country is maybe better for you, and at that, and that's exactly what we what we also want to have. That we don't want to have one international city system to replace the whole world. We want to uh, create additional options for your people. That they say, okay, you, you can go to whatever Paraguay, or you can go to the international city in which is located in Uruguay, for example. Mm-hmm. And then you step into the international city network, right? And and as you said, there are some cities who are really designed for some interest groups um, or parts of them, uh, and others have slightly different uh, rules because. Uh, I make you an exa- give you an example. There are some parts of the world where it's absolutely no problem to, to bear a weapon, right? They have no problem with that. But don't smoke uh, 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 cannabis. That's an absolute no-go. And then you have other parts of the world where smoking cannabis is not a problem at all. Or bearing a weapon, oh, right? <laughs> and so we have then to respect those things to a certain degree. I said, cannabis is a no-go or guns are a no-go, then we have to make an agreement with them. And that is just why, because the world is as it is. And we are, we'll, international cities will still be part of a host country. They have a, a large internal autonomy, but they are not sovereign. That means we have to accept some of the order public of, of these countries. This was just an example, right? Because I've seen this. Um, but uh, Nevertheless, it will be much, much more attractive. And as you as you correctly said, the big difference is you have a real contract, a service contract, a social contract in form of a written service contract. And you can always go back and look at it and say, no, I only have to pay $1,500 per year, not $2,000, right? And if you want to build a new swimming pool, I haven't signed up for that, right? Then do it. Or collect people who, who agree on that and you can charge me a higher entrance fee, whatever. But that is giving you back all kinds of decision-making powers for how you want to to, to create your or basically to, to frame your life and and your your location. And suddenly you are sovereign of yourself again, or for the first time in history. So what kind of countries right now? I, I know you probably cannot tell us exact countries, but maybe uh, mm-hmm. hint us in a region where yeah. conversations are ongoing. Because right now, what we've been talking about so far is very theoretical. And it's important to have the theoretical and understand the philosophical. Yeah. But actually, your project is more than just theoretical. Things are happening right now. Like These are really exciting times. Yeah, and it, and they have happened before. I mean, I've even before my book was finished, I was called by the 
guys who were doing in Honduran, Honduras, the first CD, right? Prospera, it's called Prospera now, but it, it wasn't, hadn't had the name back then. And I was helping them uh, because the, the government had established such a law already in 2013, but it wasn't applied until 2000, at the end of 2017, when we got the first approval. So I helped shaping the legal framework for the say the Prospera between 2017 and 2019, and then it was finally approved. Um, so, and it's still surviving now, despite being under attack of a socialist government. So I would say it's a success story. More and more people and companies are coming there. So you can see it's not just a fantasy. It has already started. It's not an ideal private city. It was a kind of a hybrid model. But um, we are going from there. And I would say, from what I have seen so far in the discussions, in that region, it's a, a Honduras, Caribbean side, the, the islands. In the Caribbean, there will be some options. In Central America, there are some options. And in Africa, are some options. There is also fewer options in the Middle East and then Far East. Um, a, a few in Europe, which are more less autonomous. So I think the real deal, go to the Caribbean, Africa, maybe Latin America. So these are probably the areas where we will first see additional uh, or international cities. So Titus, why can't we just tell everybody the name of these countries? Like, you know, why can't we just yell it from the rooftop, all the different places that we're talking to governments right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the reason is um, politics, right? Uh, if you do this too early, you normally need to make an international city happen or related uh, autonomous city concept. A law passed by parliament, uh, executed, then based on this law, a um, uh, contract with the governments giving you that right to govern this zone. And um, that takes a while. So if you now disclose a country while you're in this process, the opposition, no matter if it's from the left or, left or right, the opposition will immediately jump on that because they can use this as a political football against the government and saying, you are selling out our country or whatever the usual things are, right? So, and and that that has happened. And in so far, I think um, everybody in the industry has learned or most people have learned the lesson that they should not disclose that too early. You can disclose that once the contract, the law is passed, the contract is signed, right? And and I I say we, and I and I do consider Titus, you and I a we, because I do sit on the advisory council for for Tipolis, your your for profit yeah. company, um, and I sit on the ambassador council for Free Private Cities Foundation, and and these are passion projects that I'm I'm super excited about. Now, we had recently your conference in Prague where you were a speaker, where I was a speaker, where we had so many amazing speakers. Actually, just a side note for everyone, fantastic weekend, absolutely stunning, fantastic weekend. For 2024, you guys definitely need to check this out and I'll make sure I put it in the email newsletter for you. But when I was going through the conference and I was watching a lot of the presentations, what I really saw was there was two large groups of people. We and, and I want you, I, I say all of this because I want your, your perspective on it. We had one circle of people who were, were engineers who were do, talking about technical things, how to build this, how to create that, how do we do all of the technical aspect. And then on the other side, we had all the theoretical aspects of why we should do all of these types of things, the reason and the importance of it. And then there was me, this one sole individual, I feel like, who was talking about like the emotional side of moving to another country and giving up everything that you've ever known in your life and and packing all your bags and taking your kids out of school and having you know quitting your job or or moving your job online and same with your spouses and picking up everything you've ever known and move to a different place you know those are two really big circles and one really small circle why do you think that we don't have more people talking about the emotional aspect of moving to these international cities? Because it you have the background of um, consulting people who do the move, right? 
But we are still in the infancy with our movements. The free cities movement is not covering only the international cities ideas. It's calling covering seasteading, charter cities, all kinds of stuff, intentional communities. And, and because there's a real movement, but this is the movement in its infancy. And normally things start by theoretical ideas, right? Why should we go? What, what is it? Like I wrote my book and said, okay, this is something that could work in the real world. But in the beginning, it's just an idea. And so there we are still a lot of people talking about ideas. Then the next step would be, okay, how can we make it happen, right? How can, what, what, what are the technical issues? And I think if this is solved, and we have already a lot of people talking about that because it's happening now. The next step would then be, well, what does it mean <laughs> going into those cities? What does it mean for you? And what about the culture? Is is there also a cultural uh, uh, attractiveness? Otherwise, I'm not coming. And I think these are things which will be discussed then in the upcoming years when the first people have moved and first people have brought their families and they see what's happening here. We have first limiting experiences from City Morazan and City Prospera in Honduras. Um, and um, I think then more people will talk about the things that you already know because of what you're doing as a business, but these will become more and more important in the next year. That's my my view of, of, of these things. Well, I remember when you and I were heading back from a big party together, um, I was in the front seat, you and your wife and me and, and, and my wife was all in the back seat and we were chit chatting on the drive home. And I said, listen, you know, if we look at the largest trends that are happening in the world, OK, there's robotics, there's artificial intelligence, there's blockchain. I mean, these are absolutely massive trends, but I'm not a programmer. And OK, I'm an early adopter to crypto, but it's not I, I'm not a programmer. I I'm not going to become, you know, a billionaire. I was not the first person to ever buy Bitcoin. And I have no idea how artificial intelligence works. And, you know, those types of things, you know, other people are really making their mark in the world with this. What I actually mm -hmm. see that's going to dwarf anything and everything else on investment trends and 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 the future is how humans organize ourselves and i really believe that you know this is my calling mm. is the work on on adding my small little piece to the puzzle on how humans organize ourselves because we have relocated hundreds and and influenced not just thousands but tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people to make a sizable change in their life and move to another place. So I see this as one of the largest trends in the world. And that's why I'm so excited to talk mm -hmm. to you today. That's why we've been talking about this stuff on the program for seven, almost eight years. That's why I'm, you know, going to be a shareholder in your company and why I'm purchasing real estate in all of these places. And I've, I'm, I'm involved in all of it because I believe it is the largest trend that we will see in the future. I just think it's so massive. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a same feeling. I think okay. I, I mean, what I just finished reading the um the bio of uh, Elon Musk, the new one, uh, the Isaac, yeah, Isaacson, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's massive what what this guy, a single person, has achieved, right? And I think I can make a contribution um, like you in the areas that we know, and I fully agree with you. No matter what technology you have, if you are treated as a serf or as a subject, you don't like that, right? Even if they tell me, yeah, AI found out what you want. I say, I know what I want. <laughs> I know what I want to eat and what to drink and all these things. And so if we give people back that they have the right to choose their own lives, which is a, a bit this service idea. A state should be a service, or any what what not even a state, a, a society that has some institutions that protect you. They should treat you as a as a customer. And this is why is this probably so successful because it's already known, right? It's not a utopian idea of liquid democracy stuff where we somehow decide every day 100 times what's going to happen. No, it's the idea that we don't decide at all about other people's life, right? but about our lives and each of us. And there are people that don't like that. 
okay, they want others to tell them what to do, but for the people who who really want to make their own decisions, and there are many, I think most of your customers, if not all, are like that. This is a product for them, right? And if we if we target at the end only ten percent of the world population, I mean, it's still a huge number, right? And I think we will create twofold things. First, we will more be more creative and more productive than the others after a certain while, just because of lower regulation and more freedom to decide whatever you you want to do. And the second thing thing is the others will have to adapt to that in order not to lose all their high potential people. So the whole world will change. As uh, some people said after uh, 1990s, after the 1980, they said, hey, Hong Kong has changed China more than China has changed Hong Kong, right? Despite giving it back to, to the People's Republic because it was copied by Deng Xiaoping with all these special zones, Shenzhen, became from a fisher village, 20,000 people, now 7 million people, because they copied Hong Kong. And in so far, I think we we have precedence for what we are doing. And I agree with you, this is this is a big thing, because at the end of the day, modern, modernity, where you have all kinds of luxury and, 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 and technology requires freedom. Right. It requires freedom. And we can probably see in China what's happening if you take these freedoms away again and say, I want to own all companies. I want to make all decisions. Yeah, then the good people are leaving or stopping working. And and that the Western states will make the same experience. And I hope that we, um, I mean, you you experienced this firsthand, right? And, and I hope that we can soon <laughs> offer an alternative to, for them. Brilliant. Titus. I've got the the first edition of your book here, Free Private Cities, Making Governments yeah. Compete for You. And then the brand here's new. new. <laughs> yeah, here's yeah, exactly. yours is a little bit blurred there, but here at this one. Yeah. I bought this yeah. one at the conference. Unfortunately, I didn't get you to sign it. I should have got you to sign it while I was there. Next so, time. Next yeah. time for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't have the second edition of the book. I missed that one. What's the difference between the the first and the third edition? Where yeah. do... Well, the second edition was just some corrections. Uh, was 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 not a big deal. But the third edition is um, six new chapters, um, and things have developed. Things have happened. I have one chapter called First Experience," where I talk about what happened in Honduras and other places. Um, then we have a new chapter about uh, from special economic zone to special administrative regions. These are the technical terms, also very important for politicians because it's already there. And then we have things where I, in the last five years, have found out that maybe something is missing because people approach me and say, how do you deal? Why shouldn't we talk about that? So I I added uh, chapters about culture, architecture, um, how would we have de- dealt with COVID? Um, then and and ethics, right? Is is there a need for some ethics in free free cities, free private cities? So these are things which are um, have been discussed in the last years and uh, with people who are interested in the concept and and made some points. And I think these were legitimate questions. And so I was a total rookie when it came to architecture, but we we have a, a full time architect uh, from South Africa who's working for us, and I discovered that this is a very important issue. Right, that we and we have to address that in a way that fits to what to to the rest of our ideas is that let the market make the decisions and not the top down master plan of somebody who knows it all. So sure. that's <laughs> right. This is in a nutshell that and 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 so far I think it 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 is now more or less complete. I'm not planning for additional chapters. <laughs> uh, I think we have it now, and now we re- really have to to apply it, but. Um, we have also made change, or I've made changes and amendments in the other chapters to, to bring them up to date here and there. Um, so I think um, if you, even if you have uh, um, bought the first ver- uh, um, edition or the second one, now it, it makes sense to to get the third one because so much new stuff in it. And I think if you have read it now, you can start your own free private city immediately afterwards. Amazing. Titus, I love it. Thank you so much for the amazing conversation today. If people want to find out more about your work, if they want to get a hold of you or learn about uh, what you do, where can we send them? 
Yeah, uh, you can basically just go to my website, titusgebel.com. And there are then links to the foundation. They are free, frequently asked questions about the concept of the book. Also link to Tipolis, the for-profit company, if you're interested in becoming an investor or, or want to, to re relocate your company or yourself. Um, just uh, let me know. Amazing. And we'll be doing a special presentation on Tipolis for all of our private clients, hub members, and accredited investors in the next few weeks. So make sure you guys listen up for that. Check the email newsletter at expatmoney.com. Sign up for that. Titus, thank you so much. I will talk to you soon. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Mikhail.